People, welcome to a new episode of Trinity Trend TV's Marco Soka, where we are continuing our deep dive into the wonderful catalog, the expansive catalog of Destra. Destra Garcia. You know Destra like to jump high? Well, we going low. We going deep into the weeds, going through all the music that McGill have to offer. And you see this week is a very spicy episode. Ilikia Gil, you ready? I'm ready. I like spice. I can take the heat. You know what I mean? I like I like my little scotch bonnet pepper. I like I like the heat in general. I, I'm ready for it. Nah, Gil, I ain't sure. This is a, a a level of global warming. This is scotch bonnet. This is all kind. This is oh. bon bum see. You know what bon bum see is? Okay. When you eat too no, much pepper know. and it come out the other and side. Goes- right. This is our bon bum see episode. This is Bun Bumsy. Okay. Because we are talking about a very interesting album by Destra. One called Soka or Die. Now listen, the title says a lot, eh? But trust yeah. me, we have a lot more to see than the title. Now the thing about the Soka or Die title that's very interesting is that she makes this big declaration. You know, Soka or Die. Right. But one thing that Ilikia and I were talking about is that she doesn't really live up to that title. Right. It feels like you make this big, bold statement and then you don't really live up to it. Because as you go through the music, track by track, if we go through the album, you realize is that she often spends a great deal of time drifting away from Soka. As either right. partly... So what are you saying? Yeah, like, what are you saying? Because on one minute, yeah. you're, you're fully in it. And then another minute, you're drifting away from it just a little bit. And then another time, you're just completely diving out of Soka, like in a whole different right. genre. And then it leaves you in a space where for me as a listener, I can't speak for all you, I can only speak for myself. But for me as a listener, as I'm going through the music, I'm like, are you sure this is really Soka or Die? Like, you know, when I sit down and I think of the album, I think of like the straight up Soka song, like one of the perfect examples of like a straight up Soka for me is I Dare You. Like, I agree. That is Soka. But then she drifts off of that. She moves off of that in other records. A good example of that is when she gets to a soca dancehall track called Situation. And that features multi-symptoms. And as she's going through that record, I'm like, okay, it's still soca. It's still somewhat in a soca space, but she's bringing in dancehall. So it's no longer Mm -hmm. just like a straight up soca record. But then the other songs that to me where she does that, where she kind of just dips her toe out, where she keeps one foot in and the other foot out, is a song like Signs, where she, you know, it's like a pop rock soca kind of blend. And then, of course, the title track. How are you going to name your album? me. Thank you. No, you got it. Mm -hmm. How are you going to name your album? Soca or Die? And then Mm -hmm. the title track is a blend of genres. Ilikia, take the ball. I mean, even if the album wasn't called Soca or Die, like let's say the album was called Signs, I don't know. But if you have a song called Soka or Die, and that song is not purely Soka, what are you saying? You know what I mean? It it's To me, it's like a microcosm of the issue with the album or what we're pointing out about the album mm-hmm. itself. Soka or Die, yeah. Like Trent said, it's, you know, it's a very strong title. You're saying this is what it is. This is what it is. This is what I'm rooting for. This is what I'm going to champion. This is it, mm-hmm. which would be uh, a great thing to do on your fourth album. Mm-hmm. But when you deliver it this way and you have, it's not that you brought other things into Soka where it's still mostly Soka. It's that you're taking the Soka to those other things, which is a difference because Fly brought that stuff into Soka. Okay, and some other songs we can talk about in the future. They brought these things into Soka, but you're kind of taking the Soka here and bringing it to those other things and you're calling it Soka or Die. Mm-hmm. It's, it's contradicting. Now, if someone doesn't pay attention to those kind of details, or they're like, oh, it's just a song title, okay, they'll go. But if someone is trying to see like, okay, this was, was her idea or her team's idea when putting this album together, this is like you know, a contradiction. And then there are those moments where she just completely leaves the soca space. I mean, like when she has his song with Mr. Vegas on the floor. And that, that is straight up, to me, that's straight up dancehall. To me, yeah. to my ear. I agree. That's straight up dancehall. So now you've completely left the soca space. And then of course, there's the Independent Ladies remix, 
which is on this record. The wax my wife. Mm-hmm. She have the independent ladies remix on this record, which is a straight up disco record. Mm-hmm. And then she has the gospel songs. You know, she she loved the the gospel songs. So you have right. what it all begins with you and his eyes on yes. the sparrow, which are straight right. up gospel. So if you're telling me so called die, and then you not only dip your toe out, but then sometimes you just completely just leave soca, uh, leave that on the wayside and then go somewhere else. For me as a listener, I feel a bit like, again, I feel challenged as a listener, owning my feelings. I feel a little challenged because I'm like, but you tell me this is Soka or Die. Right. You tell me this is my album for just Soka. So then what's going on here? And, you know, by the time we get to this album, she would have been in her fifth year since, like five years of career since... Of releasing Red, albums. White, Black. Of releasing albums. Of releasing albums. And this is her fourth album. She has yet to put out a fully Soka album at this point. Mm-hmm. And then so you hear that there's an album coming called Soka or Die. Mm-hmm. And you're like, this is going to be the one. And it's not. But I will say something here. Something that's very important. Soka, and follow me here, people. Follow me. Follow me. I verbalize Soka as a pop-leaning genre. And the reason I say that soca is a pop-leaning genre and not truly pop, soca has this ability, it's very porous, it's very flexible. There's a lot of osmosis happening when you listen to soca. It's, it's constantly drawing in different sounds. And in that sense, it kind of makes it like pop. You think of soca being pop. You think, oh, okay, this is a, the Caribbean's pop music. Because unlike other sounds, like a reggae, which has a completely Jamaican stamp, this is Jamaica. You have to sing it this way. You have to play it this way. There's a certain groove. There's a certain type of rhythm. There's a certain type of progression in the music that in order for it to be considered reggae. Same thing for dancehall, which is a little more flexible, but still there are certain rules that you go by. Reggaeton, you have to play that beat, that doom, da doom, 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 da doom, doom, doom. You have to play it a certain way in order for it to be considered reggaeton. However, soca is a lot more flexible. You can have five different artists doing soca and they all sound completely different and you don't know you're listening. If you don't know what soca is at all, you're confused. It might be like, okay, what is this? So that in a sense gives it a, that porosity and that flexibility. It's like water. It makes it a lot like pop music. However, I see pop music as just being a complete gas where pop music could change color, shape, form in any way. Whereas soca, that liquidity, that that um, is not truly solid. It's it's that liquid form, that water, that watery form. I still feel grounds it just enough to keep it from being completely pop, and I consider it to be pop leaning, meaning that there are elements of it that are similar to pop, because it's still connected to a cultural space. There's still certain things that you have to do in order for things to be considered soca. It still exists within a Caribbean space now. And now at this time that she put out the album, it was still considered straight up. You ask anybody where Soka is from, the average person would have said, what is 2008? Would have probably said Trinidad. But now you move forward about 15 years and now it's more considered Caribbean because we have so many different offshoots, different branches, different subgenres of Soka. But there's still a root. There's still a cultural root to what Soka is and understanding where Soka came from coming out of Calypso music here in Trinidad and Tobago and understanding the role of the rhythm section, understanding a pan song, like we spoke about a pan song, Colors Again, on her previous album, Independent Lady. You hear those elements that make you say, oh yes, that is Soka. Because unlike pop, which you cannot identify at all by one thing, Soka still has certain identifiers. So the cultural mores and boundaries may not be as firm as certain other genres in the Caribbean, like compa, like reggae, like dancehall, like reggaeton. It may not be as firm. However, they are still there because there's a certain way that just like I identify with the reggaeton, where you had the doom, 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 doom. Soka has a very similar movement in some soca songs, but instead of going doom, 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 it goes doom, 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 doom. It's a lighter way of hitting. They don't hit the, they don't hit the drum with the stick the same way. But there's a way to approach soca. There's a certain likeness. There's a certain way the percussion is built. Although now we have so much electronic elements, so many different things added in. But at the end of the day, 
I still think soca is pop leaning. And because it's pop leaning, we have artists in the genre are able to do what they should have done this record. So in that sense, minus the songs that are just completely not soca, the dancehall and the gospel and the disco. But in that sense, when it comes to these songs that blend in other things, like soca dancehall, soca pop rock, etc., we can still consider this, you know what? It still works on a soca or die record because the, the, the flavor in the sauce is the soca. At the core of it, there's still some so there's still soca there, but she's using other things to mix it all together in that sense. So that's how I'll give her a little I'll give her grace because I see, okay, you're, you're making a soca or die record, soca's pop leaning, soca's more flexible, soca's more porous. So it allows you to put your bring in other elements and bring soca to other things and bring and or bring things to soca. You can go both ways. However, it's not like the song with Vegas, where you just completely just go, Soka or die, what's on a dance or a record that have nothing to do with Soka? I'm making sense, you know? Tell me if I'm making sense. Yes, I I think you're making sense. And I agree with uh, much of what you're saying. I do, I consider Soka to be like, if there was a pop music of the Caribbean, not pop the genre, a popular music of the, of the Caribbean, right? Okay. So not in relation to the pop that comes out of the United States. Mm -hmm. But what is the genre that amongst the Caribbean, you know, is present in many countries and we have subgenres, like all those things you said, I think soca is that genre or at least the English speaking side of the Caribbean. But soca is also present in like Dominica mm -hmm. and St. Lucia for the Creole or French speaking Caribbean. I would say those genres would be compa or zouk. Zook again coming from Compa as well. Zook is an interesting genre. Ah, Zook. Um, <laughs> yeah, Zook. That's a good dog, that little because Elikia has a picture. Oh, no, we're not. Yeah, I do. I do. But we love Zook, okay? To that point, the, or the point that I'm making, I do think that the description of what you said is not necessarily what's on the album. Mm. I think if she did an album that brought in those songs it, or the other genres as flexible, and malleable soca is into soca primary with soca being the primary element mm -hmm. that would have been soca or die and different from soca being an underlying just an underlying element like that last little bit is soca and everything else is i'm, I'm saying flip it mm -hmm. flip how the songs were, were put together so it's kind of like you're saying make soca the core and and the main thing and then you're bringing in other elements. So it's like she's making a potato, a potato salad and everything okay. else, instead of making soca the potatoes, soca is just the mayonnaise or the mayonnaise. Yeah. Because old people here would say mayonnaise. It's just the mayonnaise. Yeah. I definitely agree with you for the most part. But there are a couple little okay. parts where I could probably see I'm too sure. Like that song with multi-symptoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wasn't even that song, Gil? Tem of, uh, situation. Situation with multi-symptoms. Situation. You know. That song is very much fits it to a soca dance or space where soca is at the core for me. Okay. Because it doesn't feel like a straight up dance or record. And to me, it kind of gives me a soca dance or from where soca dance or was in that early 2000s. Like I'm thinking of Doggy Slaughter. I'm thinking of different people here, artists here who had that type of flavor to their music. So it felt like this is soca, but we bring it in something else. It has that raga connection as well. Okay. So for me, that is a record where I would say this is Soka being an example of Soka being pop leaning. However, I could definitely rock with you on some of the other stuff. Soka Dancehall is a lane though, right? Like you told me about Dancehall Soka versus Soka Dancehall. Soka Dancehall is a lane because in the early, two th well, the early 90s, we saw the rise of Soka Dancehall and Dancehall Soka because of the... It was an interesting movement that was happening and it also tied into what was going with Byron Lee and the Dragonairs, the rise of carnival in Jamaica and these parallel musical movements that were happening in Trinidad and Jamaica at the same time. Because at the rise of, of soca dancehall here in Trinidad, we had dancehall soca in Jamaica, where there was Byron Lee's work a lot, trying to blend in a lot of what was the music of Trinidad and Tobago, that driving force, which is the fuel of a lot of what carnival is, you know, the soca music and, and the calypso 
because you know Barony loves Calypso and Soka, finding a way to bring that into Jamaican space because it also ended up being part of the fuel of carnival because Jamaica culture, the rhythms, the movements are different. So how do we give this carnival that sound? How do we give it a sound? And of course, we had a younger generation that was taken, that was coming to the forefront. We had Generation X at this point was coming to the forefront of music. So as Generation X was coming in, they had to define their own sound. And we had this blurring of the lines between Trinidad and Jamaica. Because before, you knew what soca calypso sounded like. There's no such thing as a traditional calypso song or traditional soca song because they've always evolved, especially soca has always been rapidly evolving because soca in the 80s sounds almost nothing like soca in the 70s. It just shifted. And then, of course, soca in the 90s took a new form because we had a new generation coming up and they liked dancehall and they liked, they liked reggae. And they liked all of these different sounds. They like hip hop. They like all of these different things. So they started to bring that into the music. And that's what happened in Trinidad. So when Jamaica, we saw Soka pour, um, pouring into dancehall. And that was part of the rise of Carnival in Jamaica. In Trinidad, we saw dancehall being brought into Soka. And that's how we had these two different emerging genres. So Soka dancehall has its own sound that is distinct because dance or soca at its core, when you listen to dance or soca, dance all is the moving. Is the moving. Dance or soca, dance or soca, warming up, warming up. That, that song being the most prominent of them all, you can hear that dance all is the focus. But when you listen to soca dance all, on the other hand, soca is the focus and it just bringing in a dance all beat in certain parts. Like when you listen to Choo Choo that she has on her first album, when you listen to that song and you get to the mock bridge, and she said, right. that's when the beat comes in. A right. lot of what Ecstatic was doing in the 1990s, it sounds like Music Farm, Winer Boy, um, Pretty Girl, Power, um, Powder Puff. When you listen to those songs, you hear where the dance all is, but it's being brought into Soka. Because Soka is the focus. Soka is the foundation. So it's different takes on like two sides of a coin. And that's how it works. But the thing about Soka, and the reason I say it's pop leaning is because Soka can do that. When dancehall, when you bring Soka into dancehall, it's it's obvious. It's, it becomes a, a conversation because somebody will say there's a dancehall okay. song and then they'll say, but they bring Soka in it. It's weird. Okay. You know, some people, okay. some people consider it to be weird. Some of us are open to it, but some people consider it to be strange. They don't like the tempo, okay. they don't, the way the groove, the groove is gone because it, the groove in soca lives in the melody. It, it lives in a different place. It doesn't live in the guitar the same way it is in reggae. So because of that, the groove is gone. But then when you come across the soca music and you bring dancehall in, it's normal. A soca dancehall track on a soca or die album is actually great. Mm -hmm. If a soca or die album is created. It can have two approaches. One, all quote unquote traditional sounds, or two, an album that acknowledges all the different types of soca or subsets of soca that exist, right? So it could be um, a soca dance hall. It could be, you know, Denry segment. It could be all these other types of things on a soca or die album. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what's here, but that makes sense because then at the core of it all or the spine of it all is still soca. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not something you add on after the fact. It's your starting point. And you might be mindful of so many other genres in the world, not even just the Caribbean, just other genres. You might want to put rock and roll into it. You might want to put other things in it, but it's coming from the perspective of soca. So this brings us now to an interesting point in the conversation because I have a question about the gospel songs on this album. I not no people probably think at this point right hate gospel. Why trying to always talking about the girl and she doing gospel, gospel, gospel. No. I just saying. You know, you have this record called Soka or Die. Yet you still manage to bring in these two gospel records. And what crosses my mind as I go I, I mean at this point before album since so this is what going through my mind, right? Are these signs of faith by Destra? Like, is she, you know, showing how much she loves the Lord? Or is it that she's trying to prove something? So the first thing when I say prove something is, is she trying to prove that she can sing? Now, here why I bring this up, eh? Because in America, 
gospel music, the African American traditions of R and B, which is what all R and B is really from, African American people. Gospel music is considered to be the root of a lot of that sound. So how people approach the singing, especially when it's a vocal forward genre, because that's what R&B mostly is, is a vocal forward genre. Although we have trap and B and we have quiet storm and different grooves, you know, funk and different, and different things that emphasize instrumentation just as much as vocal, disco especially. Vocal and instrumentation sit next to each other on disco. But the thing about it is, and disco is R&B, folks. Disco is R&B. It's black, it's queer, it's there. But the thing about it is that stands out to me is that I start wondering why is she constantly, not, not why, we're moving away from why's, but how does a gospel song always make its way onto a Desha record? <laughs> like, where does it come from? Are you whining and jamming? Oh, come. Yes, Destra. <laughs> and then it's all of a sudden is his eyes on the sparrow. And I'm like, <laughs> I go on from Carnival Tuesday to Ash Wednesday morning in a blink of eye. And I ain't ready to go to church yet. And you, all of a sudden, I ain't from the altar. And my thing about it is, is that if she's really doing this as a way to prove that she can sing. And that feels odd to me. Well, if she is, that's really sad. And if she is, <laughs> I didn't expect that word, girl. <laughs> I thought she was going to say interesting. <laughs> that real sad. It's all love, okay? It's all love. But I, I keep coming back to this question. You know, I'm an African internationalist, as I said in the intro, African right? The question internationalist. of identity and sense of self is very important, especially as it pertains to Black people. In all aspects. And sometimes it's not immediately obvious. So if you think that gospel and R&B is the standard for singing, yes, those are black genres, but that goes back to being on the outside of the United States mm. mm-hmm. and seeing that come your way and you, you perceive it con- connected to the United States. And that's why... Like, that's why that thinking is there, if that's how you see it. Because if you're seeing America as the dominant, if you're seeing America as the standard, and I know we all, these are all assumptions that we do not know what's going on inside of Destra's head. It's just a conversation. We're thinking. It's, we're just thinking that's out all. loud here. Right. If you're using gospel music as a chance to show your ability as a singer, and you're using R&B the same way as you did, at some, at some points in your earlier, you know, your first album, Red, White, Black, you're showing your talent. My question is, you, not my question, but my, my point is, you already do this in Soka. Yes. You and what are you saying about what you're doing in Soka? Exactly. Because you do it Are you not singing? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I will say something here and it just crossed my mind. It honestly did. Because you leave probably see he, he hide in nuggets. He hide any nuggets. But let me bring this out. When Blacks, okay. you know, the Soka artist Blacks, who was, was oh, okay. you know, a part of Destra's life for many years. I thought you were saying Blacks, like, how was that? No, Please we're not black talking about black, black people. We're talking about Blacks yes. and Soka artists. <laughs> I was going to say, you call the Black people Blacks? <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible because Blacks has passed away. This is not what we're doing. This is not what we do. I'll behave. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that when Blacks, Ilikia was ready to say, you forget you talking to an African international. She was about to go <laughs> to the screen for me. But listen, when Blacks, <laughs> the soca artist, B-L-A-X-X, double X. Yes. When he yes. passed away, Destra sang at his service. And when she sang, I remember that clip went viral and people were talking, yeah. oh, brilliant singer. I didn't know. Oh, Dasha could real sing. Dasha could real sing. And to me, when I saw those, that going around, yeah, I was happy for Dasha because I know I love Dasha. But what crossed my mind was, well, she's been singing for years. Yeah. What was she doing before? 
What was she doing on Max It Up? What was she doing on Choo Choo? What was she doing on, on Savage? What was she doing on all of these records? Carnival. This girl what has, you want? What you want? This girl has been singing. But they needed to see her sing that in order for people to really take her seriously. And a lot of these comments were coming from Trinidadian people. So you're seeing people here who are now paying attention. Now, some people already knew, but to them, this was a reminder. Oh, but even this year on some of these songs that she put out, she was singing. So I'm like, yeah. What? How is this the benchmark? And then I realized it's gospel. And also, yeah. she's doing things that, because if you are consuming, a lot of us here in Trinidad and Tobago, we consume a lot of R&B, American pop. If she's doing yeah. things that are usually associated with that style of singing, riffs, yeah. runs, you know. Runs, yep. Gas. Gas is not one of them, but I have gas. Riffs, <laughs> runs, big vocal, you know, vibrato, yeah. when you're doing all of these big things, yep. to them, that's real singing. But right. when she's singing on other records, they don't look at it that way. We have the same problem in Compa. Oh. Some, some, some of the singers. Not those who are at the top. Not Gasman Kulera. Not, you know, those singers. But a lot of the up and coming who have, especially due to their age or where they were raised, if they were raised here or came here young and here in the United States, you know, they see R&B as like, oh, Compa doesn't have any real singers. Now I'm bringing singing to Kumba. They couldn't. They couldn't sing. They couldn't open their mouth. They would choke trying to sing a song that Gasman Kula can sing. I'm just saying this name, right? Mm -hmm. But you're bringing singing now because you can do a few runs. But there's a few that think like this, right? And it it is again the identity, the identity question. And the reason why we ask these questions is not because we're like just nitpicking just for the sake of like being annoying. But when you, when you do present something and say, or she didn't present it like that. Right. But if that's what's happening and you say, this allows me to sing, it does automatically raise a question about what you're doing before. What I'm saying is remember how we were talking about Creole in last week. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that in a certain generation, when kids would be in school speaking Creole, they speak Creole at home, church, everywhere in society, in school, they have to speak French. When they spoke Creole, the teachers would often say, speak. Like, if you, if you said something and then to tell you to repeat it, speak. So, and, and when you do that, when they do that, you have to say it in French now. So what was I doing when I said it in Creole? Was I barking? Mm -hmm. What was I doing? So. That's why these kind of questions come up, because it's like if you're saying if you're attaching this, if you're attaching this thing to that. What are you saying about this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in this context? Because not everything is automatically opposing each other, but in with things like this, what are you saying? That's really the question. But the other yeah. side of it, I have a question, too. If she is indeed trying to prove something with these gospel records. The question is to whom? Well, I don't know if it's a who or whom. But we'll say a whom. We put M and the end it. A whom. For dramatic effect. To whom? Is she trying to prove this? Herself. The Trinidad and Tobago. Foreigners. If, if this is still a part of trying to, you know, like, all of the above. I wonder if it's an American it's audience. I wonder if it's an American audience because remember her intention was to put out a gospel R&B record. Yeah. So I wonder yeah. if that her first album was supposed to have been that, right? So I yeah. wonder yeah. if that has followed her now. We reached so called die and that's still with her. And if some yeah. part of her, I'm putting in these records so when the time come, I have a resume of all these songs, gospel songs and songs that I've done that's familiar to the American air. Because they may not want to hear yeah. me sing about our Charlie. Or Charlie and they, right. they they might skip that. If they hear me singing his eyes on the sparrow, they're gonna stop and pay attention. So I wonder if she's trying to prove herself to an American audience. That's my question. It's a question that we wouldn't know is, how to answer. Is if that was let's, let's I'm gonna assume the answer is yes. Not because I actually believe that. I'm gonna assume it to make this point that I'm gonna make, right? Mm -hmm. 
and you make a title, an album titled Soka or Die. And then your thinking is, I'm going to call it Soka or Die. I'm going to have some Soka, but then I'm going to prove, uh, or I'm going to have some songs that attract a wider, a wider audience to hopefully bring them to, to Soka. Mm-hmm. That's the totally wrong approach. Wow. I could see that line of thinking existing and then be like, that's, that's the wrong way to go about it. I agree with you. Because yeah. when I think of reggae dancehall, right? We're using reggae and dancehall. Specifically dancehall. Dancehall, even though dancehall is, does not have one sound, and let's be clear, soca is very porous and very flexible. Dancehall, mm-hmm. although it has its very clear cultural boundaries, at the same time, because it's dancehall, is, but reggae in particular, is very much tied to Jamaican national identity. At least that's how, you know, how I view it. Dancehall in itself still has elements of other genres in it, you know. Just like reggae has elements of other genres in it. But the thing about dancehall, dancehall artists go like Elephant Man. Elephant Man did not go to America and fully transform into Jay-Z. Right. Elephant Man was still Elephant Man. Right. They They brought themselves. They brought who they were to the table. I am coming to you as a dancehall and as a dancehall artist. Sean Paul, as Papa Sean Paul is able to navigate a pop space, Sean Paul is still a dancehall artist. Right. Sean Paul makes dancehall with the occasional reggae, but he's a dancehall artist. His accent doesn't change. His music is basically rooted in Jamaica. So you're not hearing Sean Paul singing his eyes on the spiral. <laughs> well, I never listened to a full Sean Paul album other than the first one that people know of. So I couldn't tell you. But still, I never hear that on the radio, no way. So... The thing about it is, is that if you're showing up and you want to get into that space or you want to show Soka to the world, you have to show up in my, this is, I'm, 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 tell me if I'm, and we're on the same page, show up as a Soka I mean, artist yeah. making Soka music. Yeah, you can't sell to people what they already have. Hello, compa artists. You cannot sell to other people what they already have. Yes. You do you want to blend in or Sean do you want to stand out? Even when Sean Paul got into all this pop stuff, it's after. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He didn't come in like that. Nope. 2013, Sean Paul was not there. It might have been inside of him, but it wasn't there in 2003. Mm-hmm. He didn't go and say, okay, how can I make this pop? Let me go and put Jessica Simpson on the track. Let me get Christina Aguilera on the record. Let me take off this Please beat. Let me put... No. Yeah. I can't imagine Christina on a, on a dance or song, yeah? Just give me the light. That's what... That's what... <laughs> that's, what, that's exactly what <laughs> ah. <laughs> Oh my god <laughs> Oh god I glow in I glow in Like I really just scotch about it Papa. That's how I'm looking right now but yeah, <laughs> mm. you know, my question is, is and the final question in this segment, what is Desha's true passion? Is it mm. soca or gospel and R&B? Because mm. we four albums in, as you pointed out earlier, and she has yet yeah. to give us a straight up soca record. So at this stage, now we're not talking about what's to come. We're talking about at this stage. Yeah. Does she still see herself as possibly transitioning out or hoping to transition out? Because I keep seeing this gospel thread going through. It keeps popping Mm -hmm. back up, popping back up. And it would not have bothered me. Like on the first three records, yes, we spoke about how they kind of feel tacked on. But at the same time, it just felt like, okay, I'm putting it in, in here because I like gospel music. But now you have a Soka or Die album. That is the title. And you have... It's the title that's doing it. It's the title that's doing it. Now it feels like, okay, it's odd. It doesn't feel like it belongs. So on top of the gospel songs, another trend that continues on this album is making remixes of songs that were on the previous album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't really know that that's necessary at this point. You know, it's, it seems like a reach... I don't get the reasoning. Why don't you have, if you're going to make a remix, why not put it on the same album? Like, do you get, how do you feel about that? Honestly, when I get to those kind of songs, I just skip them. 
like I like remixes yeah. and I think Dasha does great remix work. But I just Yeah. When I hear like, okay, this was from last year though, or this was from Yeah. Two years ago though. Like why is this here? Like it feels odd. Because it's like, imagine you're listening to any artist and you hear like a, a, an old song remix. Now, I can get it if it is that you're putting this on because this is a bonus track that's living on the album or like you, this is a special pressing or a special something for your fans. But if it is that I'm getting every album, now I'm getting an old a song from your previous record and it, it feels like, did you have this remix and you just didn't know what to do with it? So you just decided, okay, I have this song. I'm going to just fill out the track list. I'm going to stick it on this thing. It feels kind of odd. It also kind of feels like, are you just writing on that hit before? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, especially if when Carnival Remix was on Love and mm-hmm. Are What are you saying? Like, are you not confident on the songs that you have on Love and Till? Why are you remixing Carnival now? Are you still trying to write off of that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the next album, Fly Remix. And then the next album. It's just odd. It just feels odd. It feels like it, these songs just keep popping up. These these older songs keep popping up. And it's kind of like, okay, yeah. at some point you just have to be like, I have this remix. Maybe I put it out in a different form. And another thing I notice on this record is that she continues, Desha continues to push this we culture, we identity idea throughout the record. You know, that nationalist project thing that we mentioned on the previous record, Independent Lady. But I know in this time, as I'm listening to it, it doesn't bother me. It never really bothered me, but it's just a question that came up like, you know, who is we? What is our culture? What is it? And I will say this is where soca is pop leaning and it has more of a similarity to like an R&B versus it being like a pop genre in the sense of when you listen to how the soca music is done, with Deshra is doing it in a lot of her songs, she's continuously reconnecting it back to Trinidad, back to Trinidad, back to Trinidad. On an album, she will always have at least one song that takes it right back to where Trin- to Trinidad because she understands she has some, it's almost like an allegiance to her Trinidadian-ness. I think what, what Deshra does is that it reminds me of the fact that soca is liquid and not completely gas. You know, although gas is technically a liquid. It's, it's, Liquid, but it's not a completely free form gas because it still connects it back to a space. And now, folks, after all that talk, you probably think we hate the album, but we do not. <laughs> we do not. <laughs> we have some key songs. And I will kick things off with one of my favorite songs on the album, or one of my favorite Destro songs of her entire catalog. Okay. I dare you. Okay. I dare you. Okay. This song is bold, is commanding, but it's still sexy. You know, she's saying yeah. tonight I'm in the mood. I want to whine and behave rude. If there's anything I want to do, I dare you. But she, you know, she dared him, but she's not trying to fight him. Like, I dare you. No, it's more like, <laughs> right, I dare right. you. I dare you. You know, is that it's a flirtatious. If you want to hold me from behind, I dare you come and take a wine. I like that. You know, tickle dog with spine. Yes, that's sure. Is this is this flirtation? Is a dance? It reminds me of I don't know, like being in a dance hall, being here in Trinidad. They go to like a a jam. You know, it's kind of a Tuesday night, and the place getting dark, and you wind up on somebody be in the corner by the truck, and you give them that good flex on you. I don't know. It. Fe- you can watch it be like, what the <laughs> hell going on? I just, I picked, I paid to the picture. But that is the song. Mm-hmm. And I like how, you know, as I was listening to the music, I love the percussion. I love the percussion. Yeah. I like the way that they, they really play. It sounds like somebody's properly playing. This is not some program random thing. It sounds like a player is actually doing this. And I love the way that they layer the guitars. Because there are different okay. guitars playing throughout the song. So you have one guitar that is kind of present throughout, like a one flowing guitar, like a player. And then you have some one that's just coming on as a strum. So as the drum plays, then you get the guitar kind of licking it off. So you have the drum followed by the guitar. And they kind of fill in the melody when she's, when like, where are she singing in those spaces is where that guitar comes in. So it's like multiple guitars layered with the percussion and then her voice and it just... It's a thing. So I Dare You is my key track as well. All right. Yes. My key track. Not singular. 
<laughs> for all the reasons you named. And Trent, there's a performance that I should have shown you before, but I'm going to send it to you tonight, where she's singing I Dare You. And you see what you said, uh, trickle down my spine. She doesn't even fully say spine. It's like trickle down my spine, like that. And it, it feels like as if someone's actually doing it to her as she's singing and she felt it. And then she goes, oh my God. She goes, she goes trickle down my spine, like that. Oh my God, it's incredible. Um, but to me, this song is like the a start of a new lane in Destra's catalog. Okay. I think there's a line of songs that she would make after this that fall in this lane. Mm -hmm. That if you like her for this song, you will like these as well. Attitude is one of them. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go through all of them now when we get to them, but I want to say attitude is one of them, right? And it's my favorite lane it's it's hard to say. I always feel like this is my favorite lane of Destra. I love these songs the most. But then when I be hearing her very musical ones, then I get excited about those too. So really with me, there's no, <laughs> there's no telling. But I just, it's very enjoyable for me. And it's a sass. A sassiness. It's a sassiness. And she has a, so a song called Sassiness that we're going to get to in the future. But I Dare You to Me is where something clicked, like, oh, we got a good, we got something here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but it never gets, even with that lane, it doesn't get, like, formulaic or monotonous. It, it's just, again, identity and not monotony. Well, I agree with you. I actually think that that sassiness, she had it, but I think that she really, like, found the... the Defined like she, it, yeah. Yeah, like, this was the song that it really came all together on. And then from here... I agree with you. So many songs were boosted from I Dare You. Like yeah. I Dare You just... Yeah. And it just continued straight through her career to this point up in 2023. Like yeah. it's just so many songs. And I think that it kind of almost... It's like when you want to think of what is that definitive Destra sound, you have the jump ins and the, the max it ups and the, you know, the bright melodies and the big vocal and the big sound. But then you have the, the sassy Destra. Yes. The one who gave you the attitude and the one who has that, that you know, that that presence where it's kind of like, yeah. and you know, looking at Desha's interviews and hearing how Desha talks, I think you the think sassy Desha, Desha is, is Desha. I think this is Desha's personality. So? <laughs> I feel like because Desha always, Desha's a personality. And I feel like that's energy is something that she puts on here. Like the convent, the more, the one that... You know, the, the, the one that has to think, I'm going to make a piece of music will give you <laughs> the max it up. But then the Destra who wants to just be like, okay, I just want to have some fun. Then I just kick off Destra my shoes and black. wind down. Yeah. She'll give you, I dare you. I dare you. Okay. But I have another, another key song, yeah? Okay. I like Saddle. Saddle is my, my second okay. key song. I like okay. Saddle. When I listen to Saddle, I hear this to me, if there was ever a perfect example of a Denise Belfon influence on Destra, it's Saddle. Because at the very start okay. of the song, you actually hear Destra saying she wants a hard man. You know, are you a hard man? And if you listen to Denise okay. Belfon collaboration with Masters at Work, and you listen to uh -huh. Work at the very start mm -hmm. of that song, she says, I, so you must be the yard man who comes to sweep my yard. But the way that Destra says hard man and the way that Denise says yard man, perfect match the inflection mm -hmm. the way they speak it everything is a perfect match i really okay. like what what they did there and i also like the fact that it's the energy of denise coming up in Destro. this is the jammed energy this is the, the, the okay. assertion that commanding presence that authoritative tone you know and i also like the way that Destro does the verses you know, you spoke before in a previous episode of Makosoka. You spoke in a previous episode about how Destra has this really great diction going through certain verses. Yeah. Like she was so yeah. sharp. This is a very wordy song. Yeah. All I need is an adult pleasing. <laughs> but that's what she does. She puts on that little yeah, voice. She actually puts on that voice. But the thing I want yeah. is as she's doing that, it's sharp. 
She's not missing yeah. a vowel. She's not missing a consonant. She's no. not missing missing a thing. And I think yeah. that that is so brilliant, especially when you compare it to what she does on the hook in the chorus, because she goes on yeah. that very sharp kind of delivery, very, very on the needle, to then giving you, I ride and I sat on. And she starts doing all of those different yeah. things when she opens yeah. up. And I like that. And of course, I like the double entendre. You know, that would play. Okay. Because throughout okay. the song, yet she's not really talking about anybody riding on her saddle. That's not walking around with her mm. saddle. <laughs> you know what she wanted to ride on? So I mean, she kind of is. Likia, I would like my video to be monetized sometime in the future, please. Oh, yeah, that's right. I just... <laughs> but Destra, you know, she talked... It's the double entendre. The innuendo, the little ambiguous moments. Like she going on and on, you know, she's, it's, and to me that has its roots in Calypso history because understanding yeah. a lot of using double entendre and not speaking directly about, you know, sexual ex, 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 behavior is a one yeah. way that we as black people here in the Caribbean and people in Trinidad and Tobago, especially because that's the root of it. And it, not really the root of all Calypso, but it's a very prominent part of Calypso in the 1800s as we turn into the 1900s and especially in those early recordings of Calypso. People had to sing and deliver songs with a lot of double entendre as a way to subvert mm -hmm. and navigate colonial spaces. Part of it, you were, you were basically adapting to it in a, in a sense of, okay, the tema, I can't use this, especially when we had the rise of the nationalist, right before the nationalist project. And, you know, you're talking about all of these different um, competitions that came out to judge Calypso. You could not use lewd language. You know, this is all part of the, the work to stamp out the Jamet culture. So you couldn't use lewd language. So people had to find another way to say something sexual without actually seeing the words. Right. And then, of course, you had on the other side of it, while you were still, you know, in a way, allowing the system to put pressure on you, you were bowing to the pressure. While you were bowing, you had your knife. Because this is how they were dismantling the system, by they were still getting their sexual message across. And I feel like that is what we hear coming up in a song like Saddle, because it's a very important part of understanding where Soka came from. I like Saddle. It's not a key song, but I like it. I don't hate it. I like it. And my third key song on this record, I have three, yeah? My third key song okay. is the Free It Up Road Mix with Sean Paul. I really like this record. I, I, I kind of wish it didn't have Sean Paul on it. I like it. You know, first I want to say that Destra has really great remixes. Like when she does, like when they fit on the album, they are some really great <laughs> remixes. Destra does great remix work. And we'll come to that later on. And one of her particular albums is one that's very, well, two that are very important. But Destra has some great remixes. And I feel like this version of the song really elevates the original, which I already liked. But what I also like about the remix is that Sean Paul is on the original. But I like Sean Paul on this version as well as the original because he adapts to the soca space. Sean Paul is okay. one of the few reggae dancehall artists I've heard come into soca and adapt to the space. They don't try to turn soca into dancehall or turn it into reggae so it's easier for them to do. No, it's more like I'm going to, I appreciate what soca is. I love soca music or I, I respect the genre and I'm going to come in, be myself you know, I'm not changing my accent or anything. I'm going to be myself, but I'm going to adapt to the music. I'm going to flow with the music. And I liked it because it felt like okay. a meeting of the worlds. Okay. Destra brought him into her world. She didn't go into Sean Paul's world. It didn't sound like Destra was trying to jump on a dancehall. A dancehall trip. There's reggae fusion. There's dancehall. There's pop. No, this is a soca record. I'm, especially the road mix. I'm giving you a road mix. She doesn't put on a Jamaican twang. She ain't trying to, she ain't trying to sound like anybody but a, other than Trinidadian Destro. And then Sean Paul right. comes into her world and he keeps up with her. I like it by, you know, what are you young or what are you old? Da, 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 He's hitting it very fast. Now he, he doesn't have the, the instinctive inflections and melody of a Trinidadian doing soca, but I feel like it works for him. And I like the meeting of the worlds, especially since he was coming into hers and not her trying to go into his. I respect that. I obviously know why he's on the road mix because he's on the original. But I like, I like the music of the Free It Up road mix. I like how it's put together. I just kind of wish it was just her. But what you explained, I, I accept that. All right. 
And that brings us to the end of this episode of Mako Soka, as we have just taken a, ooh, a deep swim in Destra's yeah. Soka or Die. I mean, if, if yeah. she didn't have us blocked before, Gil, I feel this might be the one. I don't think it gets too bad after this. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see in future. We'll see. Future discussions. Future yeah. discussions. But this has been so much fun. I just, I'm having so much fun. I hope you all enjoyed this series. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can get more. Turn on your notifications so you don't miss. You don't miss. Right. And if you have been following along, or you, at least you're now getting into Destro's music or you're a fan, share your thoughts. Leave a comment. Let yeah. us know what's yes. going on. You understand? I dare you. Let me use it too. No, I dare you. <laughs> I dare you to subscribe and I dare you to leave a comment. You understand? We should do Christina Aguilera remix it. I dare you. Please, no. Let's, oh, let's to what? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we have, oh my God, you know, we have AI now. Oh, no, I like don't people... do it that. No, no, not people do it AI. <laughs> Christina Aguilera was, if somebody does that and said that to me, I might, I might not survive you all. <laughs> no, Saddle might be the one, you know. <laughs> Hope you can handle it right. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Christina. Christina Gill. Christina, we love you. Christina, it's all right, Gill. Be yourself, Gill. You're damn right. 20 something years. You're stopping now. You're damn right, Gill. Anyway, <laughs> y'all, we'll catch you all the next time. Thank you so much for watching. Yes. We go on. Later. <laughs>